Okay, welcome back. So we're going to continue to talk about magnetism here. And again, I want to stress that there is no difference between electricity and magnetism. They are two forms of the same thing. And we're going to get into that in a little more detail here over the next week or so. But up to this point, we've talked about permanent magnetic fields. We've also seen how a moving charge induces a magnetic field. If we have an external force and we have a charge or an external magnetic field and a charge moving through that external magnetic field, then that charge feels a force. So far, we've been able to find the direction. Well, now it's time to figure out what the magnitude is. So what we want you to do is focus on, we know the direction. And you're going to have to keep coming back to that because we're going to be dealing with cross products instead of dot products. And so to remember that with the cross product, the order of the terms matters. It's not commutative, as we say. So you've got to make sure that your directions come out in the correct order. So we've got to make sure that we're doing the cross product in the correct order from that. And you'll see how that is as we get into it. Okay, let's get started. All right, so take a look at microtask one in the uh, magnetic force section. So as always, anytime we want to come up with some sort of an equation, we want a numerical result for something, we're going to need to find the mathematical relationships. And usually that means are they directly proportional or are they inversely proportional? Before we can do that, though, we have to decide, well, what things are involved here? So we know that anytime I have an external magnetic field and I also have a moving charge, then I'm going to feel a force. So we know that there must be at least three things coming into play. We've got to have that external magnetic field, we've got to have a charge, and then we also have to have a velocity. So under microtask one, these are those first three quantities that we're going to work with. We're going to work with the external field, we're going to work with the charge, and we're going to work with the velocity. And as you might expect, we're going to simplify that a little bit as we go on. But to start off with, always go back to those fundamental things. So what I want you to do is pause the video and think about how each one of those quantities might vary with the magnitude of the force. So the stronger the charge, the stronger the force, or the less the force, however it's going to be. Pause the video, think about that, and circle your answer below. Okay, so did you actually stop and go through all of the exercises? But it's really important that you do, and I know the tendency is to just let it go play even play in the background or whatever, but unless you're interacting with it, unless you're thinking about these quantities, it's really going to have a hard time learning. So if you feel like you're struggling and you're not actually going through the exercises, that might be why. So make sure that you pause the video and you go through this. All right, so we said that there are going to be three quantities that are involved, and we said that there is going to be the electric field, which I'm just going to write its symbol here, and that's B, and that's a vector. We said that there's going to be a charge, which we've been using Q. You can use capital Q. It doesn't matter. That's a scalar, so there's not going to be a vector sign there. And then we said it's going to be related to the velocity, which is also a vector there. So now we've got to decide which is going to give more force. All right, so let's think about this. So if I have this charge and it's moving through this electric field, so here's my charge, and it's moving this way, say, so that's its velocity, and there's some electric field coming out of the page. And remember that we decided last time that in order for it to feel a force at all, it has to be at a right angle to it. It has to be perpendicular to that. So, so we're coming across this way, and, and this is my B field, and this is my Q. If I have a stronger magnetic field, am I going to feel more force, or am I going to feel less force? Well, that should make sense. A stronger force, then, is going to come out of having a stronger magnetic field. Makes sense. All right, how about charge? Well, if I have no charge, obviously I'm not going to get any force at all, right? And so it's also true that the more charge I have, the more force it's going to experience because it's got more for it to interact with. So last one's a little bit tricky. Um, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. But the more, the faster this thing is moving, the more force. And the best way to think about that is to, again, go to these extremes. If the charge is not moving at all, does it feel a force? No. So the force is going to be zero if it's not moving. So we know that it has to be moving. And so it stands to reason then that the faster it's moving, the stronger the force is going to be. So that's going to be directly proportional as well. All right. So we want to find an expression for the magnitude. We're not trying to find the, the direction just yet. We know how to find that. So the magnetic force, we'll use an Fm for, an F sub m. And we know that that has to be proportional to We'll just write magnitudes here, so I'm not going to put the vector signs. We'll have to worry about that in just a second. The uh, velocity 
and the charge. So it has to be proportional to all three of those. All right. Okay. So keep that in mind. And then let's continue on with the next page. And if I can get that to delete there for me. There we go. All right. So we decided we were going to find the magnitude and we do need the magnitude, the man, but the thing to remember is that even though the magnitude's a scalar, it's coming out of these two vectors, two vectors and a scalar. So I have to figure out what kind of multiplication I need to do. So I can't just multiply, we'll do it over here. I, I can't just do that. That doesn't make sense, right? Anytime I've got vectors, I've got to have either a dot product or I've got to have a cross product. So I'll, what kind of multi vector multiplication do I want to use? Do I want to use the dot product or do I want to use the cross product? Let me give you a hint that force is a vector. Well, I want the vector product. That's what it's called. So that's going to be the cross product here. So the formal name for the cross product is actually the vector product because it gives you a vector out of that. So we want to rewrite that to provide our correct multiplication. Okay, now that is maybe a little more involved than you might think. Let's suppose that I wrote it down as this. And so we'll say, I'm going to do it this way, B cross V, since that's the order that we had it in here. Perfectly valid. You're going to get a magnitude that's going to be fine. Remember, though, this should give you a vector when you're done. Is the vector in the correct direction? Well, the way we find that out is we're going to be using our right-hand rule. Right. So looking at our case that we have done here, and I'll get to the hand so I can move it. There we go. So if I have a charge that's moving, so I've got I be fine. If it's moving, then that tells me that I have a current in that direction from, and I don't know how it's showing up on your video. It's backwards on mine, but it's going to go from the right side of your screen to the left side of your screen. The magnetic field is out of the page, out of the screen in this case. So therefore the vector force must be straight up. So we also have to make sure that we're getting the correct direction when we do the cross product. Now you may have been taught, you know, using this curl or something like that, where, you know, you point in the direction of one. So maybe point in the direction of the magnetic field. And then in order to curl towards the velocity, which is this direction, well, that makes the force go down. Well, that's not right because the force has to go up, correct? So as I was saying, the force actually has to be the other way around from the products because it is not commutative. And so it actually does matter how we do this. So we're going to do V cross V. So B cross V would not be correct. It gives you the correct magnitude, but it doesn't give you the correct direction. So up to this point, we've just been using you know, our right hand rule and we can still do that with the cross product. But only if we have our quantities in the correct order. Okay, so that's what we're saying here. We know how to find the direction, so we gotta make sure that we're getting in the correct direction. All right, so let's go back to our definition of say the dot product. Remember when we did that and we said that if I have two vectors and we have A dotted into B, and these are just generalized vectors, and they are not perpendicular or parallel to each other, so they're somewhere in between. There's some angle theta in between them. What is that equal to? Well, if you don't remember, you look it up, but it's going to be the magnitudes of A times B times the cosine of the angle between them. All right. So, but in this case, though, we have the cross product, the vector product. So it's going to be still the magnitude of A times B, but now it's going to be multiplied by the sine of the angle between them. So that's how I'm going to get the magnitude of that. So if I want to get the magnitude of the force, remember, just the magnitude, and they're not at a right angle, what would my equation be? Think about what we found with this equation right here. Stop a moment and write it down. Okay, well now we're just talking about the magnitude, so not the vector sign here. And so that's going to be Q and then V cross B. So that's just going to be the magnitude of V, the magnitude of B, and then the sine of the angle between them. Again, this is just the magnitude but this works for whether they're parallel or not. 
to get the direction, I'm going to have to go back to that right-hand rule, uh, except now they're not going to be perpendicular to each other, and so I'm going to have to think about that angle and where, where they are. But remember that that angle is relative to V and B. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Q's a scalar. It can't have an angle. It doesn't make sense for it to be at any kind of angle. So always that theta is going to be the angle between V and B. If they are at right angles to each other, if they are at 90 degrees, then all of this is going to work out to give the same way that we've used before. Okay. All right. Then we've got a little note here that notice that this is the force due to the external magnetic field. The moving charge produces a magnetic field as well. However, remember that the field of magnetic force can't act on itself. That violates conservation of momentum. So we're always talking in this case about an external field, but don't forget that there actually is a magnetic field being generated by that moving charge as if even though it's moving through the magnetic field let's stop and think if that makes sense even if in this case down here even if i had no external magnetic field i've just got a charge moving this way so here's my q and it's got some velocity v does it have a magnetic field sure and that's our right hand rule number one we grab it we point it in the direction of the current and our loop is going to go around this in the direction so in this case it would be into the board on the top side and coming out on the bottom side. And of course, that's just making loops as it comes around. So they're going to be in this direction. Okay. So it's there, but we can't, that can't apply a force to the actual wire because that would violate transformation of momentum. Okay. So let's look at the next problem here. Look at microtask three. I'm going to slide that up so we can see it. All right. Suppose we have a magnetic field that's directed into the page. And remember, that's our X's. That we have here. So we want to know what is the direction of the magnetic field, I'm sorry, what is the direction of the magnetic force that's acting on this particle. So here's my particle Q right there and it's moving upward at some velocity v. All right? We're not going to calculate the magnitude but I want to know what is the direction of it. Stop the video and think about it. This one's going to get a little bit tricky. Okay, so this. So again, we have IB fine. So my magnetic field, it, my current is going to be up because that's the direction my charge is moving. My magnetic field is into the board, IB fine. So my force is to the left. It's to the left side of the screen. So as this thing moves, it's feeling a force in this direction. And we're going to, let's actually change the color of that so that we can see it. Let's go to red. So it's got a force acting in that direction. All right, so now the question is, how will the charge move just a little while later? It's not gonna continually move forward, right? And it's not gonna make a right turn. Stop and think about it. See if you can describe the motion of this particle inside that magnetic field. Okay, well, let's think about it. So I'm gonna draw it off to the side here. So my particle is initially moving this way. There's a force, it moves a little bit, and then there's a force that's acting to the left. So that's gonna make it curve. Well, now there's a force that's still acting to the left because I'm still perpendicular to these magnetic fields. So that's gonna act this way. It's gonna make me curve even more and so on and so on. And so you should see that over time, this particle makes a kind of an arc. And if we were completely immersed in the, in the magnetic field, if we stay completely in it, then it'll be a complete loop like you see there. So this tells us then that the particle is going to, it's almost like it's orbiting. It's not orbiting anything. There's nothing in the middle. Just the presence of the magnetic field is making that charge turn. All right, so it's gonna be a curved path. Take a look on the next page, on the next micro task, and we're going to talk about some of the implications of this because this has a lot of practical applications. Okay, so we found that the magnetic force was center directed, and let me redraw that to make sure that we all are understanding what we mean by that. So I'm moving this way. No matter which way I'm going, the force is always at a right angle to my path, which means it's always directed towards the center. So if we think back to what we did last semester, we talk about kinematics. This is a centripetal force. Centripetal literally means center directed. So what is the expression for the centripetal acceleration? 
And it's okay if you don't remember it. What you should do is go back through your flip book where you, from last semester, which you should always keep handy, and go back through it. See if you can find what the expression for the centripetal acceleration. We want to know what is the acceleration here. And just as a reminder from last semester, remember that the centripetal acceleration is changing the direction of the velocity, but not the magnitude. All right, pause the video, go find it. Let's see how you do. Okay, you got it and write it into the blank there so that you've got it available. Okay, what you should find is that the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R, where R is the radius of curvature. That's that distance that you see right there. We can make sure that our units work out. This, the top part, has units of meters squared per second squared. And then we're going to divide by meters. And that leaves me with meters per second squared. So it is, in fact, an acceleration from that. All right. Now, what is the expression for centripetal force? Now, you may have found that in the same part of your notes. But if you can't, this is actually very easy. Just remember Newton's second law. Newton's second law, if I have a constant mass, is simply F equals MA. So the centripetal force here is just m times the centripetal acceleration. And so the centripetal force must be equal to mv squared over r. And it's getting kind of hard to tell the difference between my letters, but that's a v, and this is an r. Let's see if we can make that a little more on screen. OK, what we want to find is we want to set this equal to the expression for the magnetic force, the magnitude of the magnetic force that we just found. And we want to solve this for the radius of rotation, r, that value r there. Now, as we point out here, notice that the angle, as I move through this magnetic field here, remains at 90 degrees. So the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field is always going to be 90 degrees no matter what. All right, stop the video, work that out. We're going to get a very important equation. Okay, so we know that... The centripetal force is just that magnetic force. That's the only force that's acting in the problem here. We're neglecting gravity, of course. And so that tells me then that mv squared over r must be equal to qvb. Again, this is the magnitude. And if you don't remember, we've got that sine of theta. Sine, and so theta here is going to be 90 degrees from that. So the I'm going to take this and I'm going to solve it for R. So I'm going to bring my R up to the other side and my QVB down to the other side. And I'll find that I get R is MV squared over QVB. I can cancel out one of those Vs. And so this is MV over QB. And this is called the cyclotron equation. Uh, and because it gives us the radius of rotation, and you should see that it depends for any given uh, any given magnetic field and velocity, it depends upon the ratio of the mass to the charge. So this is unique for each isotope, each, uh, each atom, radioactive atom that I might have, or even regular atoms as well. But so what we see is we use this in a device called a mass spectrometer. And you see that right here. So as I come into get my pen back, here we go. As I come in this way and I enter the spectrometer, let's say that that beam of all of these isotopes has a whole bunch of different isotopes all mixed together. Maybe it's from some nuclear reaction or whatever. As soon as they enter that magnetic field, though, because each isotope has a different m to q ratio, they're each going to have a different radius of curvature. And so what I do then is I put little detectors all along this at different Rs, what would be effectively different values of R through here by the time it hits. And so I can count the intensity of each one of these. And so when I plot it, you know, I might get a lot at this one and maybe just a little bit at this detector and nothing at the next detector, and then a whole lot at the next detector, maybe quite a bit at that one and so on and so on from that. And so that's why we call it a mass spectrometer because it's giving us the spectrum, meaning the amount of each of these materials as they come through. And that helps us analyze what's happening with the, the nuclear reaction that's going on. So this is one of the most important things that we've got. Now, go back through that and make sure that that makes sense, because this is something you should be able to use. This is something you know, every physicist needs to be able to use at some point. Okay, 
Now for us, the magnetic force is what's making the electric, an electric motor turn. And when we're working with robots or you know, pretty much anything out in the real world, we're talking about using electric motors. That's very popular right now. So we don't generally measure the charge moving through a wire. We've talked about this before. What is it that I actually am going to measure through the wire? Well, that's going to be the current, right? So as I'm measuring, I can't measure the individual charges, but measuring the current is actually quite easy. So what we want to do then is to rewrite this expression so that it is written in terms of the current instead of the charge. So we want the magnetic field, the current, I, and the, and the, um, so I'm sorry, the magnetic field, the, and the current instead of the charge of the velocity, because the charge of the velocity is going to give us the current. All right, so let's go ahead and delete this thing. All right, so look up at the top of microtest four. And let's get rid of some of our extraneous things here. Just so that we got a nice clean workspace. All right, let's go back to what you've learned before. What is the definition of current? Go back through your flipbook. You should have this written down. Okay, so there are a couple of potential answers. You might have said that the current is the amount of charge within a certain amount of time. Okay, that's more like the average really through there. And we can be a little more precise by saying that the current is dq dt. And this is the definition of current that we've used pretty much most of the semester through here. So in general, the amount of charge throwing, flowing through any part of the wire is going to be the same you know, over that amount of time. So it makes more sense to write it this way. Okay. This next area here is just in case you, you went with this form. So we're actually going to stay with the calculus form, the dq dt from that. All right. So how does the velocity depend upon time and distance? And this is from last semester. So go back through your notes and see what you can find. Okay. Now, some of you may have said, oh, well, velocity is the distance over time. And well, okay, that's similar to what we had before, but this calculus-based course. So the velocity is going to be dx dt. So rather than using this distance, and maybe you did use an x there, but it's going to be the derivative of the x of x with respect to time. Okay. So the total force is going to be equal to the infinitesimal force, this df, um, going through this tiny bit of wire dx. So we've got everything that we need. So let's see if we can find the magnetic force in terms of the current. It would be worthwhile for you to stop the video and go through this on your own. And I know some of you are like, well, I'm just going to wait for you to do it, Dr. K. Yes, but this is a skill that you need to learn. And so it really will help your understanding if you go through these steps with it. All right. Okay. Well, let's get on with it. So Let's get you started. So we have DF, that tiny little bit of force there, is going to be equal to the small amount of charge, DQ, times my magnetic field, times my velocity, and sine theta, like that. So remember, it doesn't make sense to talk about an infinitesimal piece of velocity. I have to have an infinitesimal piece of charge with that. But now we're going to substitute in for our velocity. We're going to substitute in our definition here. And so that tells me that df is going to be dq b times, oops, that's dx dt sine theta. And we've done this kind of manipulation before. Remember that if I'm going to integrate, I can only have one differential and it has to be in the numerator here. So, but I can move these things around just like they were variables. So I'm going to rearrange here and I will get that b is times dq dt dx sine theta. So that's equal to df. Well, now, based on the, the definition of current, we've got what we want. So df is going to equal b times i dx, that's dx, times sine theta. All right, so to get the total force, all we have to do is integrate along the length of the wire. And so Let's do that. We'll put our integral sign in here. We're going to start, we're going to assume that our wire starts at zero and then goes to some length L. All right. Now I can pull 
b and i out enzyme theta out of the integral. Do you see why? Because the current is the same everywhere, right? So it doesn't depend upon the where I am. If you think about the circuit, if I just have a straight circuit, it's going to be the same everywhere. And even if I branch along those branches, the current is going to be the same through there. That's basically the charge continuity principle. This, to bring it back home, remember that when we had a battery and we wanted to connect an LED, which might look something like this, we needed to limit the current, but it didn't matter if I put my resistor before the, the LED or after, because the current going through the whole thing would be the same. So the same thing is true here. So that tells me that F then is B I, and of course sine theta is also constant because it's the angle between I and B, and integral from zero to L of dx. Well, okay, that's just simply L. So my final result then is that I got F is I, we'll write it this way, I L B sine theta. Now that's the magnitude of the force written in terms of the current, the magnetic field, and now also we need to know how long is it moving through the length of the wire. So that should make sense. Now we need to have we need to have some sort of vector multiplication, right? If we want to, our force to be a vector. So do I want to have the dot product or do I want to have the cross product if I want the force to be a vector? Yeah, so I'm going to, just like before, it's going to be the cross product. Let's go ahead and close that. So we can use the right-hand rule to figure out our order, just like we did before. Remember that it has to be right angles. And so what you'll find then, if you choose them properly, is you will get that the force, the magnitude, or the vector form of the force, is I times L cross B. And we're going to go ahead and make that L be our vector, because remember X was a vector, it was the position. I was basically a number, and yes, it's got a sign as far as which direction it's going, but here we're just looking at a number for that. So the way you can remember this then, it's with that good old Southern saying, well, ILB. Well, ILB, it is the force, isn't it? So that's what, that's where we're going to go with this. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next page then. So now we're going to try our hand at a scenario. And what this is for is for designing a magnetometer. This is a way to measure the strength of the magnetic field. And this makes a great magnetic field sensor for a robot over here. So what we want to know is what is the magnitude of the force? Now, we could design any number of experiments that will do this, but having this spring here is probably going to be one of the easiest ways for us to do that. So the quantities that we're going to have is our known quantities. We're going to have the magnetic field. We will have the current. We will have the length of the wire. That's this this is the wire right here. We'll have the length of the wire. Obviously, we're going to need the spring constant because it's going to determine how much this moves. The distance that the spring is displaced. And then, of course, the magnetic force and the angle between them. Well, the angle between them is going to be 90 degrees, if you see that. So let's take a minute and let's think about which direction that force is going to be. So, again, just use your right-hand rule. You know that the it's... I be fine. So we know that our current is going to be in one direction. Our magnetic field is going to be here. And then the force will be in that direction. Now, if I have my current in the opposite direction, it's going to work the same way. It's just going to compress the spring instead of stretch the spring. And for practical purposes, usually that's what we want to do, right? We want it to go up into the robot. And then the robot's able to measure what's going on with that. All right, so our equations in this case, I'm going to move the hand here just a little bit. So our equations in this case are going to be the two equations that we just derived. So we're going to have F is I L B. And of course, that's going to be sine theta. And then I also need the force due to the spring. So this is the magnetic force, and this is due to the spring. And from Hooke's law, that's just going to be K times D, where D is the displacement of the spring. All right, on the next page, you can solve it. I'm actually just going to keep it on the same page here. We're going to go over in the margins so that we can see everything that's going on here. This is not terribly difficult. You should, all you need to do is just equate those two things. 
and close this. So since it's in equilibrium, I know that those two things have to be equal. And so that tells me that I L V sine theta must be equal to K times D. Well, in this case, of course, theta is 90 degrees. So I get I L V is K D. And I want to solve for the magnetic field because it's a magnetic field sensor. So I just divide everything else out and I get K D over I. So if I have a known spring constant, then I can measure how much that compresses, assuming I've run my current through the wire in the correct direction. I know the length of the wire, so I know everything that I need to be able to detect any kind of magnetic field that the robot happens to be moving through. Okay, so we derived this expression for the magnetic force, and now we've got a quantitative, a number for it, a quantitative value for it. But more importantly, hopefully what you've seen here is how we can apply engineering to physics. Engineering really is just applied physics. We needed, we had a, a functional design we needed. We needed some way to detect that magnetic field. So we went back to the physics of the situation. We worked out what that expression could, would be. We worked out a design that would use it. And now we've got a nice simple expression that will allow our robot to detect the value of the magnetic field anytime we want. So this is typical of what we do in engineering. And even if you're not gonna be an engineer, learning to think like an engineer will actually serve you no matter what your career is. Okay, we'll see you next time.